shopping is a revolutionary act. What does that mean? Um, people assume that you know consumerism is, is this awful bad thing. It's the plight of the mindless masses to walk around and gobble up products and spit out uh, money. And it's, it seems to be. I've always been struck by uh, you know the word shopping and how it's taken um, in, uh, in this in the sort of context of a consumer society, even with the you know, the, the current name of, of my company, I, I get defensive, oh, I'm, I don't shop. I, I don't shop, I, I'm not a shopper. And then I say, well, you're wearing a pretty new pair of jeans and is, that's an iPad in your hand, so you bought that somewhere. People start to recognize, yes, we do, we live in a consumer society at the end of the day. We're no longer hunter-gatherers, right? We're not. We're not making our own shoes and our own clothes. Some people still do, but very, very few of us. We buy gadgets, we buy books. We share this with our friends online. You know, I've read this book, you should check it out. I've found this new band, you should, you should check out their new CDs. Um, uh, I love my new Galaxy tab. Uh, that sort of thing, we talk about these things. Uh, you know, quite often women are more, more associated with a found, like, this, this great deal on a pair of Jimmy Choo shoes, right? So we do talk about this uh, at length. So we, you know, we are living as part of a consumer society, but I've always been struck by how this, the relationship between buyers and sellers has been set up as a bit of a tense one, right? There's a lot of war metaphors that we use when we, when we talk about marketing, you know, from a marketing perspective, we're targeting this demographic, like we're hunting them down and shooting them in the streets, right? Um, from the consumer side, um, even the word consumer makes some people's skin crawl. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very passive word. And as well, um, from the, uh, from the, from the, you know, the consumer buyer side of things, a lot of people get defensive when it comes when you're like, Oh, this is a you know, about shopping. I don't shop. I don't, you know, these people over there, those you know, mindless consumers, they shop. I don't shop. But we do. Right? We all maybe buy is a better word. We feel more comfortable with it. But the problem is, it's a very very tense relationship that we have at the end of the day. And what we're talking about as shopping is a revolutionary act here today and I'll turn it over to Doc pretty soon, is what would happen if we put the customer, the individual, at the center? I mean, currently, think about how we uh, interact with brands and vendors online. We, we search and they send their little cookie bots and tracking software and retargeting software after us, that pair of um, Uggs follow us all around online and they keep showing up in the sidebar of every website and we start to feel like we're hunted down online and we, we are in a sense through the searching the data that we're producing. But what would happen if we knew what they knew and we could do something with that information? And uh, I will turn this over to Doc Soros, uh, the uh, founder of a movement that was a light bulb moment for me, uh, called VRM. Okay, so um, how many people here know about uh, CRM, Customer Relationship Management? Most of you probably do. It's, it's by various measures a $16 billion software business. If you're just talking about Salesforce plus um, uh, Siebel, which is now Oracle, and that means the rest of you are talking about $16 billion. It's about $80 billion in terms of the amount of money that's spent at the retail level um, that's inclusive of anything that tries to uh, do these things with customers, um, which if you look at the language that's used by a lot of people in CRM, um, we, acquire, uh, we acquire these people, we call consumers, and we manage them, and we lock them in, and we control them, and we own them, we talk about owning the customer. And this is the language of what? It's the language of slavery. And this is basically the, what's been programmed into, um, into uh, e-commerce, the programmed e-commerce before that. Um, it goes back as far as green 
food stamps and uh, which were loyalty cards at their time. Um, but the idea for VRM really came out of the uh, unfinished business of a book called The Clue Train Manifesto, which I co-wrote in 1999, came out in 2000. Uh, it's now quoted by over 5,000 other books. Uh, it's credited, I think, inaccurately with helping start the, the social revolution. Uh, it certainly has had a lot to a lot of influence on marketing, the whole idea of conversational marketing. If you look up conversation and marketing on Google, you get about 30 million results. Um, and most of them are people selling conversation as marketing or conversational marketing. And uh, there's something that Chris Locke actually said in Clue Train, which is, uh, we are not seats or eyeballs or end users or consumers, we are human beings and our reach exceeds your grasp. Deal with it. And that was a really wonderful aspirational statement. What's that? One more time. I hear you. Can you say it one more time? Oh, his, lock, his, his quote was, we are not seats or eyeballs or end users or consumers. We are human beings and our reach exceeds your grasp. Deal with it. And it was actually just a little gift, a little, uh, you know, a little graphic he sent around uh, by email to the other three guys who were writing it at the time that really galvanized us. And, and what it did was it put us in the position of of the users, of the customers, looking at, out at the marketplace. And, and as I said, it was an aspirational statement that I think was actually wrong. It was wrong in this sense. We are really not yet independent. We are really, you know, our reach does not exceed the grasp of the sell side. Um, the way that the web, the way that the internet, not the, you know, the web is constructed on the client-server model, um, has put us in a subordinate position. We are always uh, the submissive party whenever we sign a contract, you know, is it, we agree to this thing, and it's a pile of words that we're never going to read anyway because one of the terms in here is that we reserve the right to change the terms, and by the way, nothing applies to the company ever gets sold. The, so there's, I mean, it's, it's been lopsided since the beginning, but it's sort of normative that we're accustomed to it. So I felt starting in the early thoughts about uh, 10 years ago, uh, working in the identity uh, space, uh, helped start an identity workshop, driven the digital ID world. I didn't think that worked either. Um, and what I felt was that we needed tools that made users, people, individuals, both independent of any seller or any controlling party and better able to engage. So these two things, independence and engagement. The term uh, VRM uh, came up during the Gilmore Gang podcast when I was explaining it. A guy named Mike Fazar said, well, you're talking about the reciprocal of Sierra, the VRM, and it just caught on. So I didn't resist it. And then when I became a fellow at the, uh, the Berkman Center at Harvard University in 2006, I started a project called Project VRM. Um, and I chose, I chose that topic in part because I was IMing with Jeremy Miller, who's in the second row here, and who's uh, the, the father of Jabber and the XMPP protocol. And he said, I think we can pull together the code to do this thing in a long way. And so it's been a code development project. And as of now, there are probably 20 development projects um, various ways working on parts of what will become vendor relationship management. The box of tools that you and I have that are ours alone and at our disposal that allow us as independent human beings to carry our end of whatever relationships we have in the marketplace with other entities in the marketplace. And, um, and there are parts of this are, for example, personal data stores. Um, uh, Jeremy has one called The Logger. Uh, there are another one called Higgins. There are a number of different development efforts that are going on to give us ways of controlling our own data, to gather our own data. Uh, Adriana has done some work on, on providing um, sellers with ways of, of giving data back to us that they've collected about us or on our behalf. And I believe that inevitably we, through self-tracking and other things that Adriana's been working on, um, and, and many other things that are under our control, we are going to be the primary, the, the actors in the marketplace we needed to be ever since won the Industrial Revolution, and we became subordinate parties, and we are not going to be subordinate anymore once we get the pieces out there. So that's what we've been working on, and that's what all is part of. Sounds very revolutionary. So Christopher. <laughs> um, uh, Chris Coffey was the first one to explain the, the VRM concept to me. I, I, I talked to Doc a little bit about it. I'd gone to a you know, couple of different panels where he was on. And I still didn't understand like how this was going to work until uh, Chris threw up this amazing um, 
didn't actually throw up. You didn't throw <laughs> up. Yeah, you put up this amazing uh, scenario uh, that made, it just made the light bulb go off for me. So, so continue. So, so as, um, you know, as Doc was starting to, to think about a lot of the VRM things, how it worked, and just resonated very strongly. I had been thinking about a lot of these same things back in the, the late 90s.
collaborative, almost kind of global village types of, of things going on where the customer is driving the relationship, but it is much more collaborative. Both parties are clearly getting the value out of that and not trying to you know, show that one of these four worlds is going to win. There are going to be times where we have feet in all of those, but just being able to recognize as organizations are starting to interact with each other where things are uh, coming into place. It was really interesting this last week, uh, there was a startup that was announced called Zarly that is that idea of an individual putting out a request into the marketplace. I'm looking to purchase X within you know, five kilometers of this particular area for this price and starting to push out the demand of the marketplace. We're starting to see more pieces of this starting to, to come into play. Um, and as, as Doc said, there are uh, you know, a couple of dozen projects that are starting to tap into this, um, many of which Adriana is, uh, is working on. Well, <laughs>
never do without me. So that's that's kind of the balance of power. So for me, BRM has always been about addressing the balance of power between vendors and customers. How that happens, there are many routes to that. But I I believe the best way, from from my perspective, is to make use of what I do online, how I track and how I transact, use that data, uh, and that data sounds boring, but context is not. And anything that I do, any self-knowledge, is not boring, at least to one person, and that's me. Um, so use that as a, as a way of getting attention of vendors and realizing that there is something far more valuable than they could possibly get without me. And through that, get the balance of power. That, of course, requires a much more direct relationship than we currently have. And it does require a certain technological rejiggling or re-architecturing of the way we currently own data, create data, and share data. So um, one of the things that I'm working on is an open source project called the MINE project. MINE being the MINE as an ownership and MINE to MINE data. And it's, it's actually very simple in its in what it's trying to solve is a granular sharing of data streams with different people. So how do I share my data with the Hyatt? Some kind of complicated setting, what if I could, them, could give them a feed that is just for that particular vendor? Um, how do I create, create that feed that's sort of technological? Let's, let's say a divine merchant gets a feed that's just for them. Um, let's say I go to a restaurant, I take a picture of a bottle that I like, upload it to mine, tag it with wine, and lo and behold, that wine, the picture of wine goes to the feed to the wine merchant because the feed was generated through the word wine. He, his feed contains tags wine. So that, that's one way of doing it. And um, the issue there is that the technology allows you to create a direct relationship with as many vendors as you want. How you manage that, RSS is the usual. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of my shtick. Say, let's try to relate to vendors directly. The issues of scaling, absolutely, but that will come when, when you see how we manage that. We're starting to manage lots of uh, contacts and data online anyway. So this would be just part of that. And um, definitely something I'd love to see. So um, Jeremy would probably agree, and I'd love to actually And uh, the Locker Project is really um, looking at 
the very, very first thing we need is a place that a person owns that their data can exist. Because uh, right now your data is sitting in someone else's servers all over the place in someone else's domain. So the Live Project is all about open source project that collects your data from wherever it is, be that the social stuff, Facebook, Twitter, also in the long run, get like your, your health stuff, uh, if you're, you're run keeper and you're Fitbit, um, maybe your web browsing history, your, your messaging history with people. It's your place that you own, it's secure, your wire. And uh, on top, once you own that data, then you can start to build the applications like what you're building with how you exchange that data with, with vendors and how you express who you are um, to whoever you're working with. It needs to be in your control first. Yeah. And that's where what I'm trying to contribute to this process. Uh, it's on GitHub. Um, it's developer only sort of thing right now, and hopefully that'll change in the next month or two. So I'm mean, sort of just tracking on Twitter and GitHub and your developer. What's it called? The Locker Project. You can search Google for Locker Project, so it'll show up there. That is a great article on the right web that, that I think they did a nice way to Yeah, they did a nice way to it. So I'm excited to help. I am JDRMA. Awesome, thank you. So, um, and you mentioned uh, Fitbit and Runkeeper, and this is an example that I quite often use when I think about uh, when I think about like where the problems lie in doing all this signaling. I've become a runner over the last year, so I log all of my runs to Runkeeper, but I also got the Nike Plus shoes. So then I also run an iPod and, and get my pace. But I also tra track my heart rate, the polar heart rate monitor that goes to my watch. And then uh, I was just given a Fitbit by a friend. That's four places to log one run. And none of them talk to one another. None of them. Like there's no way that I can, without, just, without actually manually entering each of the numbers that come out of you know, the, the average heart rate, the distance I went, the pace that I was running at, you know, manually entering those in like a spreadsheet myself. There's no way to, to bring those, those four places together. And um, you know, this, is, this is problematic because you know, this word is totally overused, silos of data, right? But it's true. It's like everybody wants to, and not, and not that Runkeeper is bad, or even Nike is bad and like wants to make it frustrating for us, but that it goes back to what Doc said earlier. It's about owning the customer because to them, the data is super, is the, the core, is the valuable part. But what they don't realize is if they free up the data, the data isn't the valuable part. The only reason the data is valuable is because it leads to a sale. So at the end of the day, the sale is the valuable part. So if the customer had the data and could come to these products, right? Come to the store, come to the run keeper, come to Nike, and, and there would be a, a transaction, a sale there, or a relationship, and a long-term uh, long you know, buying pattern there, that, that is way more valuable than holding all this data in the silos for not only us as the individual, but also for the, the vendors with brands as well. I like it. We've had for a long time, but it's become so normative, you know, question it. Is the all silo approach to everything? There are something like a billion different uh, commercial sites on the web. All of them have their own databases, all of them have their own servers. You are a client for each of them separately. The clients you get from each of these are work only there unless they are a client. The cookies, I'm sorry, the cookies that come from each of these work only there. You know, our, our browsers are, are baskets of cookies that we get that work only with one site. Um, uh, Joe Andrew, who's uh, in our community, a really good post three years ago now, in January 2007, where he talked about how we need to be points of integration for our own data and points of origination for what gets done with it, and how do we architect that? So um, I, I want to throw some props around and some other, some other people um, as well, and some other projects that are involved. Um, uh, Phil Whitley, who's the former CIO of, of the state of Utah and has a company called Kinetics, um, is um, uh, 
uh, two couple of guys here, Sam Curran and Brad Vinson, back over there, are working with, with Linux. Well, Phil has a really great slide presentation. He talks about the history of e-commerce in one slide. It goes, 1995, the invention of the cookie, the end. Uh, and, and that's where we are. We, we sort of like stuck with the cookie when we are the sellers. But what do we have on the other side? What can we build this way? So what Kinetics has created is, um, uh, is a way of looking at the world where you have endpoints, real endpoints, um, and every place is an endpoint. Your brake system might be an endpoint, this microphone might be an endpoint. And you can write rules about how those work with other things and what those rules trigger and, and, and there are engines where those rules get carried out. The point here is we escape to some degree from the client server world where we are, where we are always the submissive party and we're always submitting to a dominant party. And and, uh, and the real challenge here, and we were talking with, was talking with Jeremy about this last night, and it's, is, and it's in front of all of us actually, is how do we create the next system in which we are independent entities? And so, um, and there, again, there are a bunch of people working on this. So Drummond Reed is in the front uh, row. He's one of the creators of uh, a, a standard called XDI, and he's got a company called Respect Network. Um, he's working on something that happens one layer above the personal data store. And there, by the way, in addition to Jeremy's work, there's other personal data store work going on. And, um, I highly recommend, by the way, coming to the Internet Identity Workshop, which Kalia is in the back row, uh, has a lot to do with putting on, and is where we have it's a workshop. That we just with this stuff together. And this is Brian back there, right? Brian Bellendorf is one of the fathers of Apache, which everybody uses, and is more familiar with the problems I'm talking about than probably anybody, and is lately focused on healthcare. There's a lot, there's a lot of work going on in VRM and healthcare that has been going on for a much longer time than we've been using the term VRM. I put less stress on it, mostly because I want to see it solved in my lifetime, and I think in the US it's going to be hard. Um, and I'm probably the oldest guy in the room. Um, but what I want you all to get into, for those who are not developers in the room, to get a sense of is that there's, there's more than a zeitgeist going on, but there's actually a lot of work going on that's probably it's going to be coming together probably in the next year. Um, and, uh, and something's going to break through. And, and a hard thing to fight, and I encourage you all to do that, is imagining that all solutions to everything are social or involve the term brand, you know, or involve reputation or any of the other buzzwords that, that the VC seem to like right now and seem to be very buzzy and right. But, um, this is personal. This is this is personal empowerment. It's not just a social empowerment. There are social sides to it, but it starts with the individual. So we're, we're starting to see now around the individuals parallels a lot of the things that we saw in the 90s. In the 90s, within big organizations, there was this drive towards these unified systems. There were all of these silent systems in various departments, and then there were all these integration efforts to pull them together, and then there were systems like SAP and Oracle that were put in place that actually had everything in one place you could actually do something interesting with it from the business's point of view. And now we are just on the very, very leading edges of having both those same problems and the start at those same types of solutions from an individual's point of view as well because we do have this idea where we've got little bits and pieces of our selves, our identities, our histories online in these various places and tools like the Logger Project and other types of systems that are starting to come online are starting to pull those things together and what we're going to see is a lot of these types of parallels. Right now, if you look at organizations that are trying to make some sense out of all of these different bits of information that are floating around out there, they're doing, you know, quote, listening activities and such. And what they're doing is trying to put a big um, you know, a big reverse megaphone out there trying to listen to everything that's going on, trying to extract out the pieces that are potentially relevant to them. As, and, and the reason they have to do that is because there are all of these different bits of our information kind of going out in the, in the diaspora out there. If we can, and where we have the cases where all that stuff starts coming together, as relationships build up between individuals and organizations, instead of trying to listen to everything and call out the bits that are potentially relevant, organizations will just start listening to the people who matter to them and it will be significantly beneficial for both sides because the individuals are getting what they want faster, the organizations aren't spending insane amounts of money trying to make some sense out of this big mess. You know, the cookies aren't entirely evil bad either. Like, for me, my uh, experience, for instance, uh, on Amazon got better and better 
as I got more over time, right? So the recommendations got better, uh, a lot of stuff that I didn't need to see got filtered out, the, the deals seemed to get better, the emails were less frequent, because every time I logged on, I think they realized that I was going back really frequently. So it wasn't that it was a, like the cookies that Amazon was planting in, you know, in, my, in my sessions or the, how they were tracking their, their CRM about me was bad. It's just that I don't really know what, uh, what they're tracking. And there's just a little while ago, um, this really cool browser plugin came out called Binomite. Does anybody here use it? It's by a guy in San Francisco who we to here. Um, so you, you install it in your browser and it tells you what the cookies are picking up about you and it reads it to you. And it's just to gather that data for you over a period of time and sort of reads it back. And I realized by using Binomite that cookies are really stupid. They're like so, like what they infer from what you are doing is completely off. Um, very few, very few times do they actually read back uh, anything right. So it, they're they're imperfect on that on that side. And then also, I don't. So now I know what they're inferring, but I can't correct them. There's no way that I can be like, okay, let me give you some feedback so you can make my web experience actually really better. And that's what VRM is. Is like taking. We are. It's our personal cookies, right? In that way, like where we're. We get to plant cookies in the other direction based on our own decisions. Many billions of dollars are being spent right now, uh, invested in better and better and better and better guesswork about what you might want. And there's a huge belief system around this that we can make it better for you. You trust us. We are so good, and we've got our quants that used to work on Wall Street, and they're out of that business, and now they're working in San Francisco, tracking you on the live web constantly, telling you what you're going to want. And they suck. They're really bad. They're really bad. When you start digging under it, you know, go to Blue Kai and look at what they know about it. They're bragging about this because they have busted so hard on the Wall Street Journal. Go and see what they know about it, but guarantee it's wrong. A lot of it is wrong. And not only that, it's not very much. You know, I mean, my, my favorite scene lately is my 14 year old kid and his 14 year old buddy in opposite ends of the country having a Skype session with them, looking at each other over Skype. And they're sending Gmails at each other to see what kind of advertising they get out so they can make it. Okay, consider what that means, okay? There's a lot of waste going on in advertising right now. And I'm not against advertising. We can make advertising better. VRM's not about better advertising. VRM is about demand, going straight to supply chain. Here's what the hell I need. You know, work with me. Yeah. Chris? Yep. I just, um, yeah, actually, what you done? It's a, there's a cute. Yeah, um, I was going to say, um,
data store. They get really excited about it instantly. They understand, and if the customer can come to them with vendor-neutral data uh, on what their, their taste signaling is, awesome. Uh, as far as the architecting, that has to do with standards. And one of the things I love about standards is there's just so many to choose from. <laughs> so and hopefully with these personal data lockers, like in uh, all these different projects that are going on, we can kind of get it together and maybe like come up with something that will work, where we can actually create standards and architect it in a way that this 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 data can be made really useful going back and forth. Is that does that answer your question? I just give a big number. I'm, later this week, or the, this week, I'll be talking to a bunch of the biggest retailers in Europe, in Zurich, actually, in Wednesday. Um, we get the next, I'll be talking to Best Buy and General Mills. Um, the big guys are interested, and what I'm going to tell them is invest in the people that you're seeing here, and, and, and talk to the developers, partner with them. The, your customers are going to be independent, you're not going to control them. Having a loyalty card doesn't mean they're actually loyal, it doesn't mean they like being trapped. The customers are going to get more and more independent. That's not a threat, that's a promise, that's something you've got to deal with, and there are people developing on that right now. Go deal with them now, it's the time. Yeah, I, mean, I think there are two different paths that are happening in, in parallel because all of these things ultimately are about relationships, and it's not just the brand, and it's not just about the, the individual, it's both. And there are really two journeys that have to be happening at the same time. On the individual side, we, you know, the folks who are in this room, need to start not only thinking about these things, but doing it, you know, it's trying out these different types of stores. It's putting um, our needs out in the marketplace to see what is happening and moving up that stack from being completely passive and completely you know, receptive of, of messages and such, and over time going up to a point where we are actively engaging in our business relationships and driving. There's a parallel journey that's going to happen on the, the vendor side where right, you know, a couple of years ago it would have been you know, completely push-oriented types of, of things. There's a next step where there will probably be particular kind of maverick groups within the organization that are thinking about this stuff, might be listening to a particular individual, you know, right now there's all this buzz around finding influencers and such, well, instead of trying to listen to everything and call that stuff out, actively try to listen to 